In 1971, while I was a graduate student at the University of Pennsylvania, I met a young man named Dominic Bash. And that person, that personal relationship, really transformed my whole life. Dominic was raised Roman Catholic, but was attending the Episcopal Church on campus at the university. Because, as he told me, the Catholic Church had nothing to offer him as a gay man. And so, he asked if I would help him and his gay friends to feel more welcome in the church. I contacted some priests that I knew, and we had a mass, a Eucharistic celebration, at Dominic's apartment for him and his multiple gay and lesbian friends. And that Eucharist was so transformative for those individuals. It helped them to feel part of the church that had been a part of their growing up. That Eucharist was also transformative to me because I didn't know what to expect. I had never met any homosexuals as far as I knew, and I didn't know what was going to happen. But I found that meeting Dominic and his friends just changed the stereotypes that I had about lesbian and gay people. Now remember, this is 1971. Well, some of you can't remember that far back. <laughs> but in 1971, the climate, the, the social milieu in our country was that lesbian or gay people were sick, sad individuals, had some kind of psychological problems. And this is what I thought. But soon after, in the 73, 74, the, the professional associations, the psychiatric association, the psychological association began to change their diagnosis, their way of viewing homosexuality. It was now viewed as a, a variant form of sexuality. However, it took so long for those, those statements to kind of filter down. And, and frankly, these, these um, intellectual arguments really didn't help to change my way of viewing it. What changed my attitude was meeting Dominic and his friends, um, meeting these people who became my friends. And I realized that lesbian and gay people are no different from my heterosexual friends. And so that changed my way, my attitudes, my way of viewing homosexuality. Dominic kept needling me. He kept saying, now, sister, what is the Catholic Church doing for my gay brothers and sisters? We are having this wonderful liturgy here on a weekly basis for my friends, but what about the broader Catholic community? What is the church doing? So I spoke with my religious superiors, who were really women of great vision in those days, and thinking in the early 70s, and I was eventually assigned to full-time lesbian and gay ministry. And what that meant was that I helped to start an organization called New Ways Ministry that educated the Catholic community. And so I traveled across the country to give workshops and educational programs for Catholics to help us to overcome these attitudes that we had, these homophobic attitudes that were around in society. And I'm happy to say that I'd like to think I contributed to some of that change because polls today show that Catholics, by and large, Catholics in the pew, are quite supportive. About 78% support civil rights legislation and more than half support same-sex marriage. Now, that wasn't the case in the 70s or the 80s, but happily, that's the case today. Well, while my religious superiors, the women, were very happy with the work that I was doing, not everyone was, so there were complaints made to the Vatican. 
In 1988, the Vatican announced that it was going to investigate my ministry. And this came from the Congregation for the Doctrine of the Faith. Now, the former name of the Congregation for the Doctrine of the Faith was the Inquisition. <laughs> so I was being investigated by this Inquisition. This investigation um, took maybe about 12 years, at least a dozen years. And the final result came uh, right at the turn of the century, and the Vatican decided that I should be prohibited from doing this ministry, despite the objections of my community that, that uh, had recommended that I continue. Well, I took a year and went around and spoke to the Catholic members in the community that I knew and asked if they would write letters to the Vatican suggesting a, a re-examination because the process had been very flawed. So the Vatican received thousands and thousands of letters, not just from this country, but from other parts of the world. And as a result, um, they were not happy and that the Vatican decided that um, my community should impose some sanctions. So I was asked by my community then to withdraw from this ministry. I remember that day sitting again in this office in Rome, being given this news, and what I envisioned was a woman a woman who had been battered by her domestic partner, a woman who was old beyond her years, a woman who was afraid to speak up because she feared for herself, her life, and the safety of her children. And I, I, felt, like, I felt like that battered woman, not that I had been personally abused physically, but I felt personally abused emotionally because of all that I had been through. And so I sat there like that woman. But like the woman who is battered but finds some kind of grace to go to a shelter and she begins to tell her story over and over again to people in the shelter who would listen, I realized that as I had traveled around the country in that previous year telling the story about that investigation, I had gained strength. I had gained strength to speak up and not be afraid. And so I said that I choose not to collaborate with my own oppression because I realized no one can silence you. No one can silence me except myself. I had chosen all those years not to speak up because I was afraid. But I had the courage, like the woman in the shelter, to say, no, I will not collaborate with my oppression. I knew the consequences would be dismissal from the religious community I had been a part of for about 40 years. I still felt called to religious life, and I still felt called to speak as an advocate for lesbian and gay people, for those who have no voice in my church. I was able, thankfully, to find a religious community that would accept me and my ministry, so I transferred to the Sisters of Loretto. The Sisters of Loretto are an American congregation whose mission is to be pioneers. That was 15 years ago. Now, in those 15 years, the Loretto sisters have received nine letters from the Vatican, essentially saying, if I continue to speak out on behalf of lesbian and gay people, that I should be dismissed. But the Loretto sisters have stood firm, and in fact, they just write polite letters in return, saying that she is doing the work the justice work of our community. And I'm happy to say that uh, we've received no letters in the pontificate of Pope Francis. So he's one of my heroes. And just last week, we returned from a pilgrimage. I took about 50 lesbian and gay Catholics and families and friends, and we had an audience, a uh, general audience, at the Vatican. But we were given VIP treatment because we sat right up on the stage 
to the left of Pope Francis. So, now, I, th this sounds like a wonderful success story, and I have asked myself, um, why or how did this all happen? Now, uh, honestly, I've made lots and lots of retreats and prayed a lot about my future and what I should, should do. But one retreat stands out in my mind, and I'd like to share that with you, because it was very important in my life. It was at the Carmelite Monastery in Baltimore. And I was one afternoon jogging on one of the paths, and I looked down at my shoes. I had sneakers on, and I said, oh, these great sneakers. And I thought, well, what if I were jogging in Birkenstocks? I usually wear Birkenstocks, you know, the floppy shoes. And I thought, well, I would probably trip. Or what if I were jogging in um, shoes with a little higher heel? Well, that might hurt my feet. But I, I thought of all these different shoes, shoes that were too loose, shoes that were too tight, shoes that were too big or too small. And I thought, well, I could probably do it for a short length of time. But if I, if I jogged in shoes that weren't just right, I would probably hurt my feet or, and then hurt my back and my posture and generally hurt my health. And that meditation on shoes stuck with me. It became a little anecdote that said to me, I had to find the right shoes for me. I had to find what I called the God shoes, the shoes that fit at that moment. What was God asking me to do? What shoes should I walk in? So why am I telling you my story? Because we all have God shoes. We all have shoes that we're meant to walk in. Your shoes may be different from mine, and your shoes may be different from the person sitting next to you, but we all have shoes that we have to find that fit just right, that I call my God shoes. If we are to grow in faith, in our love relationship with God, if we are to grow in personal character or integrity, then we need to find those God shoes. And God shoes are really just following your conscience and engaging in discernment to know what is the right thing to do. So I ask you, and I pray for you, find and walk in those God shoes. Thank you.